Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to episode 19 of Survivor Strong, the podcast where we talk about all things related to childhood trauma. I'm Yvonne Sandemir. We're starting a little bit early tonight. I I hope that's okay for everyone. Um, And I know you usually don't see me on Mondays, um, but you have to know that I would do anything to accommodate my guest tonight, which is Dr. Trinity Michaels. He is an alternative psychologist and host of his podcast, Psych Candy, right here on Fireside. <clears throat> Trinity, I am like so excited to have you here. Welcome to Survivor Strong. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and invite you to come on stage. Oh, there you go. I see that you've already. There we go. I'm accepting you. Perfecto. I think that you're here now. I I think I am. How oh, are you? Wonderful. <laughs> I'm, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad to have, I'm so happy to have you here. And I have to tell you, I'm definitely a fan. <laughs> I appreciate I'm, that. Thank you so much. I'm a, I'm a psych candy fan for sure. Well, thank you for a comment, uh, changing your schedule around to make this happen. Because yeah, yeah. You know, when, you, when you sent that invite, I was like, I really want to be a part of this. So. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I'm just so happy to have you here. And, you know, so when I, I, I heard your episode, I think you it was titled Insanity. but. In that particular episode, you talk about perseveration versus perseverance, and yes. I knew I had to have you on the show when I heard that. <laughs> uh, it's, I love it. You, I know, and you also touched on repetition compulsion, which is like a totally fascinating topic for me because that's something that I struggle with with someone who has complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, okay. So I really am like so excited to kind of like get your thoughts on everything. So, absolutely. you know, before we, you know, we get into everything, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, um, and alternative psychology? What is it? <laughs> and <laughs> how does it differ from other th- types of therapy? Absolutely. Um, first off, well, uh, I did all of my schooling in Europe and so forth. And I originally was going to be actually going into criminal psychology, but I ended up with so many, so many credit hours for clinical. I stuck with clinical and that was, I mean, but it ended up being a good decision. And, okay. Um, and so, but with that, my focus has always kind of been driven in a way of, um, I like thinking outside the box. I'm definitely okay. not, uh, I am not a textbook uh, therapist. And so I developed or came up with my own system of atmospheric therapy. Hmm. And what that means is, is that, and I had to do a four year study to prove my point. Okay. So I did my four year study and I had to do it with 10 other colleagues. We all had 10 patients. Everybody had the same kind of symptoms, that kind of thing. Well, at the end of the four years, though, I had a 60% success rate. Hmm. And here was the difference. The difference was that atmospheric therapy means that I personally do not believe in bringing a patient into a four-wall system. So in 27 years of being in practice, I've never had not one patient come to an office. Oh, wow. Come to an office. You're not going to lay down on the couch. We're not doing any of that. We're going to go walk in the park. We're going to go and uh, sit at a coffee shop. We're going to go and be in a in an atmosphere where the patient is able to actually relax and feel comfortable and actually just express themselves. That doesn't happen when people go into a four wall system. And part of this, too, the, it goes down a different road. But to understand this is the reason I developed into this was also because I believe that is the concept of how we operate in our minds. We operate sometimes in that four wall system. We operate in a capacity where we are so structured to understand or look what society deems to be the appropriate or the right thing to do. And we lose sight of the unique creativeness that we are as individuals. Mm. And so I believe in breaking that four wall system. I don't want to be in a box. I don't think your problems are going to be in a box. Now, Mm. granted, a lot of us, we compartmentalize. We, we do that. We, we do the box mentality, but 
is that how we are designed to operate? No, because a lot of that box mentality, that was not brought on by your, that was not brought on by you being a human being. It was brought on by other human beings feeding into you. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about box mentality, what do you mean by that? If someone who's not sure what you mean by that? Well, so the box mentality is people that, a lot of people that overanalyze or over, over analytical about everything. We, and, and, and a lot of times too, people who can't really keep a maintain or focus on something that's maybe harder or more of a challenge, we like to put it in a box. We put it in a mm-hmm. box, we put it up on the shelf. We're not going to deal with it right now, but we know where it's at. We know that we've, we've organized ourselves to a degree. But Mm -hmm. that is a compartmentalizing situation. It means that we're not dealing with it now, but we're we're stocking up. Mm -hmm. And and the problem is, is that a lot of people, they get so many boxes up on the shelf that that's whenever you begin to fall into that place of, well, I'm overwhelmed. I'm I'm depressed. I have have major anxiety now. I'm Mm -hmm. triggering all these other aspects because you've layered up all of these boxes of things that your subconscious knows exactly what's in that box. But your conscious mind is constantly trying to, we don't want to think about that. Mm. You know, don't, don't worry about that, Yvonne. Let, let, let's just focus over here right now today. And you know? that's suppressing and that's where all yes. the suppressing emotions and all of that comes in. Mm-hmm. Wow. I just Absolutely. wanted to say hi to Deanna for joining us and also Nikki. Hi, thank you for joining us. Um, that's really fascinating. Um, and cause I mean, I've been in therapy now for about eight years, twice a week, um, in an office and okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that, and, but, and that's, but that's and worked it. for me, but right. I right. can see how it wouldn't work for everyone. So it's, it's right. interesting to have this alternative to that for, for people who may not be comfortable sitting in an office for eight yeah. years like I have. <laughs> you know? well, see, um, well, a lot of time for some people, like when you go into an office, you're, you're gearing yourself up for like, all right, I'm, I'm going here for, for this specific purpose, but sometimes that makes people shut down like mm-hmm. a little bit. And then mm-hmm. you got to come back out of that shell. Whereas, you know, I do, I have, I have patients that will go, we'll walk around the lake and I can do more in an hour conversation, walking around the lake, talking about the ducks here and there and all that, but then diving into stuff, I will gain more from that one hour than I would if I had that person come to an office over the course of a month or even two months. Wow. And that's just because you think that they feel more comfortable being out in the open and, um, you know, in nature. Yes. Wow. So that just goes to show you that there isn't just one type of therapy, you know, because something that I, I promote, heavily here is, you know, healing and seeking therapy for, you know, childhood trauma or or past traumas. Um, And, you know, I have to say that I have focused on find a therapist that you, you know, you can go to, but, you know, it didn't occur to me that there's this other option that might work better for some other people. And so if I wasn't aware of it, I'm sure a lot of other people aren't aware of it. And, you know, and so maybe knowing that this option's there, they would feel, I don't know, maybe a little bit more comfortable reaching out to somebody knowing that they're not going to be stuck into an, stuck in an office, you know, for an hour at a time. And that's exactly it. And, and and the other point too is that, um, you know, the w- with the style that I do, I, I'm a very tough love therapist at the same time. So mm-hmm. I get, uh, I mean, I have colleagues that will send me people that they've been <laughs> doing in an office or whatever for however many months or years or whatever, mm-hmm. and they'll send them to me. And because I try to break people past uh, a set mentality about mm-hmm getting therapy in other words so if you're going to get therapy you're getting it for specific reasons especially when it does relate to things like trauma and and abuse and depression and all of these things well going in and and making somebody you know and and again i i I love and appreciate the fact that you just said i mean that you you've had success with yours and that's great Mm -hmm. and it does going into an office is not i'm not tearing that down that's a good thing but yeah but for some people they've maybe have done that a couple of times they got 
shut down by the wrong kind of therapist. Yeah. And now they have a now they have a bad perception about psychologists and psychiatrists and understanding mm-hmm. the difference between the two. And so right. now, you know, hey, go to therapy. No, I've already tried that. It doesn't work. Screw it. I'm not going to do that. You know, and that's right. how a lot of people think. Whereas I'll take somebody out and I'm like, like, look, okay, so you've had this in the past. Now let's work on this now. I'm not going to bring you into an office, but what I am going to require of you is that you will make progress within four weeks or I'm going to let you go. And I make people shine a seat of paper that states just that. Hmm. that if you're not making progress in four weeks, I am not the therapist for you. Wow. And I can tell you, though, with 27 years again behind me, I've used that practice for 27 years of that sheet of paper. Mm-hmm. And I've only had two people that I had to turn away. Wow. Wow. So, you know, because that's something that I hear a lot too. It's like, well, I've already tried therapy. It's it's not for me. It's like, no, you didn't you didn't try the right therapist. You haven't found the right therapist yet. Right, and it's important to. I mean, and yeah, and I've had and now I do consultations, and I've had people be like, no, you know, what you're talking about, just it, something's weird about it. <laughs> it's like it is, <laughs> it, it is weird, absolutely, and uh, yeah. and so yeah, and and they'll go and find somebody else, and that's fine, but um. But yeah, but for some people and for a lot of times with people that really have gotten ingrained into that, well, that repetitive cycle and so forth, yeah. I, that's what I do. I, I break that cycle. That's what I work with people, with couples, wow. with individuals, and really helping people get outside of that box mentality. Let's don't compartmentalize. Let's start taking the boxes off the shelf. Let's take the lid off. Let's leave what's inside. Let's deal with that box. Now let's throw it away. And now let's go to the next box, you know, and that's really yeah. what it's about. You know? Yeah. I, you know, that's a, it's a really fascinating method that you have, you know, that you've, that you've acquired over all of these years. And, um, I'm just so thankful to have learned about it and that the people joining us now know about it. If they weren't aware of it, that, you know, if you're afraid to go into an office, that's not the only option that, that you have, Absolutely. you know, that there's another option out there. Well, thanks for sharing all of that with us. Um, now, let's get into the good <laughs> stuff. Let's get into what we came to talk let's about here. It. Let's okay. do it. Perseveration. If you, hey, if you, if you yes. invite me, uh, if you invite me on the video, I will come to video with you. Oh, will you? Oh, great. Okay, yeah. let's do video. Let's I can't see. do it. You have to invite me. <laughs> uh uh huh. Okay, I see. I, I just invited you, so you, you should have oh, that yeah. now. There we go. Awesome. Yay. There you are. Oh. Awesome. Okay. All so right. perseveration versus perseverance. Absolutely. What's, what's the difference? All right. Well, let's talk about this. Okay. Well, first of all, perseverance, okay, is steady persistence in a course of action in spite of difficulties, obstacles, or discouragement. Okay. But Perseveration is the pathological, persistent repetition of a word, gesture, or act. Now, to understand both of those things, okay, people who, for example, who have extreme uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and things of that nature, okay, well, that's where perseveration kind of comes in. Perseveration is that it's that bind in that cycle that gets planted in this has to happen there's no other options for this like Mm. this is what needs to happen right now or i'm not going to be okay (laughs) okay Mm. Mm -hmm. but perseverance though is being on a persistent course towards a goal and you're willing to do it regardless of what is actually going to lay in your way regardless of that obstacle regardless of that hurdle so the difference is, and people confuse these two things a lot, but they really are very different because yes. perseveration, perseveration is more of the mind cycle that's going on. Okay. Whereas perseverance is more coming from your spirit, if that makes mm, sense. Oh, absolutely. Like your ambition, your drive, your, yes. all of those things, your initiative, that's where the perseverance yes. comes from. Yes. Okay. And how does one persevere after childhood trauma? How do they get out of that cycle of perseverance into perseverance? Right. 
Well, here's the one thing that happens a lot with people that have come through childhood trauma is that we get so enamored by other people. Oh. Everybody's always got an opinion. Everybody else always has an opinion about what you've been through, what you're doing. Are you doing the right thing? You know, you need to listen to me. You need to do and what happens though is we start layering up over the problem. And so when we get into that, well, the repetitive compulsion mm -hmm. aspect is because we've never actually been in a position to resolve what we have felt or what we've been through. And because of that, it creates that space of, I'm not okay with this, but I haven't resolved it. And, but I also made it my normal. It became right. what I was used to. So now I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep right. putting myself in these situations because that's what I've made part of my perseveration. I've right. made this now part of that cycle. And so until you get something that's going to crash through that, get you to that different mindset, get you to that different pattern of what I'm doing right now is not okay. So I've got to change it. Okay. Yeah. And, and you actually just answered my next question, as, which was going to be what holds us back from persevering. And it's what you just said. <laughs> what holds us back well, is staying in that mindset, that loop of putting yourself in these situations, no matter how harmful they are, just because that's your normal. That's my normal. That's right. That's, I just, that's just how it is. Yeah. Like, Yvonne, it's just, it's just how it is. That's just how my right. life is. You know? Right. And I grew I'm up that way. I grew up that way. This is just how I am. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The people who don't realize that you're your own individual and yes. you don't have to do things the way that your mom did or your dad did or anybody else did. You have right. the power. Oops, sorry. You have the power. I get all riled up hitting my microphone. <laughs> you have the power to... Make a change in your life, a positive yes. change. You do not yes. have to keep doing the same thing over and over because that goes to the insanity that you were saying, yes. <laughs> you know, talking about insanity, right. that yeah. doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. You know, it's, I, I do, I do a, a lot of, uh, you, I know you'd sent me uh, one of your questions going to be, what is my main focus area? Well, I deal with couples counseling a lot and I deal with, mm -hmm. I deal with couples. I deal with, I deal with all that, but here's the one factor that comes in. I mean, 75% of the time and it's one of the people in this relationship has the childhood trauma, has the background that they never resolved. And, but also they bring that into a capacity where they let themselves get into an abusive relationship. And now, that abusive relationship connects with the triggers and the past that you've already been through. So now what have you done? You've trauma just made bonding. it okay. Trauma bonding. And you just made it okay to be in the same kind of relationship all yeah. over again. Because again, that's what I'm used to. I'm used to it. You know, this is nothing yeah. new for me. Okay. Well, that's the most harmful capacity you can be in. And then, I mean, again, th that, layers off into 16 other shows that we could do. But my point is, that, <laughs> know, you know, know, but when you, when you get into that, that, that abusive mentality, being yeah. emotionally abused, being physically abused, being, you know, being torn down a lot of times you've already been through that with family. You've already yes. been through it with prior relationships. You've already been through it. And, and so you, and now not only are you doing the perseveration, you're also compartmentalizing. Mm. You're doing the boxes. You're putting it up on the shelf. You ain't going to deal with that right now. Mm -hmm. That's right. Let's it. suppress that a little bit. Let's, let's suppress it. Yeah. And then yep. you start getting to the position where now you're projecting. When mm. things trigger you, the person that you're, person that triggered you don't know all the other stuff that's going on with you. So now, though, you're projecting and you're taking – that mental filing cabinet of all the bad stuff that's happened to you and just pushing it right over onto the person that just triggered you. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. And so and that becomes part of that cycle too. Yes. That's right. That's right. You know, not to say that to me. 
<laughs> you know that upsets me. You know right. that, you know, those, but it's like, but this is where, you know, we have to understand that we're responsible for our own triggers. And this is yeah. why it's so important to seek therapy so you can identify those things because without the help of therapy, it's difficult to know why you're doing the things you're doing until you have someone with the training who's been doing this for years who can help you kind of look at yourself and delve deeper into yourself and say, well, you know, why am I really doing that? What's really causing that? And I'll share something with you. I had therapy today. And I discovered in therapy today that this trigger cycle has been going on between me, my husband, and my daughter. Because we all have different triggers from different things that have occurred to us. Mine mm -hmm. happens to be childhood trauma, sexual abuse, incest, neglect, abandonment, you know, you name it. My husband's is, you know, he, you know, he had a wonderful childhood, but, you know, he didn't necessarily receive all of the um, encouragement that he should have received, the support that he should have received. And my daughter is disabled. Um, she has autism. So, you know, she has her own way of dealing with things. And she, you know, she's still, uh, I just found this, out, I find, found this out. I've been divorced now since 2010. And I just learned that she's still angry about that. You know, so she was okay. getting, <laughs> she was getting Matt, my husband would say something to her that would upset her, would trigger her. And then whatever she said, the way that she reacted would trigger him, which then in turn, I said, I don't like how you're handling this. Right. You right. Know? right. <laughs> you, you know, it was all innocent, of course, but I was triggered, you know, and if I didn't know that, I wouldn't have been able to go back to him today after therapy and say, you know, by the way, just so you know what's going on here. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, yeah. You have to know about yourself. You have to, I mean, and, trust yourself and get to know your emotions, you know? That's the thing right there. Now, and I want to I want to jump back to something you said just a minute ago. And, and that was that you, you stated, like, nobody's responsible for your triggers. However, one thing I want to point out, which connects to what you just said as well, we get to a place where, like, today – how people are today, society as, as a whole, nobody yeah. knows how to properly communicate. Right. There is no proper communication. Well, if I'm not going to communicate what I'm thinking and feeling, how the hell are you supposed to know? And how right. are you going to deal with it? You're not. You're going to be leaving the other person to assumption, speculation. I'm going to decide already because, well, we've just been together for so long. I already know what you're going to say. I already know mm. all this. But whatever's going on and especially those triggers you have to communicate those moments to your person to family to yes. friends to you got to communicate that so people actually understand okay this is what's going on with you now i understand mm -hmm. like if i do a b and c it's making you think about that other box sitting on the shelf right. that you don't want to touch right now it's that connect right. thing but you have to communicate and people don't that's right communicate. I agree. And so not only is it our responsibility to know our triggers, but when we're in our own personal relationships, it's our responsibility to communicate that to our partner, Absolutely. like you said, because Absolutely. they don't know unless you tell them. And, right. you know, you have to make them aware of things that you're sensitive about or else they're just going to keep doing it and you're just going to keep getting triggered and just keep getting upset and, and, and asking why did, why, why are we fighting all the time? Why do we always <laughs> argue about That's right. this? You know? That's and right. It's because like you said, it's unresolved trauma. That's right. No, doesn't matter where it's from. Trauma is trauma, right? Um, right? That each of us have, and it's our responsibility to work through that. So we don't continue on in these relationships where you keep allowing yourself to get triggered and not communicating to your partner. And that's how relationships end. You know, that's how, that's right. That's right. You know, it's yeah. If you, that, that lack of communication, just like you said, and you know, other than communication, what are some other tools that, you know, that we can use to keep us on track to keep us, you know, from kind of, backsliding if you will well one of the biggest things is that and, and 
I've actually got a show that's totally dedicated to this. That I was talking about the fact that we don't, people don't allow themselves to sit with something. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples I use is, you know, like, okay, Avon, I want you to sit in a room. I want you to turn the TV off. I want you to have no music going. I want you to turn your phone off. And I want you to sit. And I want you just to look out the window. Look at the wall. Just sit there. I want you to sit. <laughs> and then I want you to see what comes to the surface. That boredom is going to start to sit in. You start to feel edgy. You're like, mm -hmm. I got to do something. Oh, where's my right? phone? I can't you do know, it. You're, bigger, you're, can't, you're getting yeah, all fidgety. I can't do it. <laughs> I, like, I got to turn my phone on. No. Yeah. Sit, sit with it. Okay. Now, this is an exercise I do actually do with people. Hmm. And I make them do this. And here's the point. The point is that if you do not allow yourself to sit with a feeling that's happening, be it anger, anxiety, fear, uh, confusion, um, uh, scared, you know, fear, I mean, like being fearful of like abuse, things of that nature. If you don't let yourself sit with something, you're never going to understand how you personally can actually resolve past it. Because you've mm -hmm. never let yourself sit with it to understand how does how does a Vaughn deal with this feeling? Now, most mm -hmm. of the time, the 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 example of the boredom. Okay, how does Trinity sit with the boredom? <laughs> I need my phone. My phone's coming on, baby. <laughs> yes. All right, yes. but but the thing is, so but we have to. If I if I don't touch the phone, I'm okay right now. Is this boredom hurting me? Is it uncomfortable? Sure, because I've overstimulated my brain all mm -hmm. the time, every day. That is the same cycle that happens with trauma, with abuse, with all of those things. I have over amplified the or, or over exaggerated that in my brain so much because I can't just sit with it to work through it. It's mm -hmm. too much. So therefore. Yeah. I'm going to get to a point. No, I got to cover it with something else. And no, now I got to cover that with something else. And no, now I got to cover that. With, now you're layering up. Now you're overwhelmed. You're depressed. You're yes. anxious. You're stressed. You, you, feel de you feel defeated. Okay. We have to take things in stages and in steps. So the tool that you asked about, the first tool is actually testing yourself to sit with something. I feel angry right now, Yvonne. I, I'm, I'm really mad. Okay, well, let's sit with the anger. For a minute. Don't react. Don't launch on the person that made you angry. Don't mm -hmm. go in and start trying to pick out a new box to put it in. Sit with it. I'm mad. And you know what? Mm -hmm. It might. It's okay for me to be mad for a minute. Yes. I can be mad right now. I'm going to feel what this anger is, and I'm going to decide how is Trinity going to deal with this. You're going to decide, how is Yvonne going to deal with this anger I'm feeling right now? Am I going to overreact? Am I going to say something that I don't want to say? Am I going to make my life worse by some action that I really want to do right now? No. You're going to mm -hmm. sit with it and realize, I have to elevate past this place. Right. And when right. you do but that for that first time, you, you continue to elevate. Absolutely, because when you sit with that emotion, with that anger, not only do you are you able to kind of decide what you're going to do with it, but y you get to figure out, okay, why am I angry? What is exactly. making me angry? What does this remind me of from my past that could exactly. be kind of seeping into now? Yes. It's, okay, what is this feeling and where is it coming from? And that's the right. only way that you'll be able to process through those emotions is right. to identify, like you said, sit with it, figure out where it's coming from, what you're going to do with it, right? And how you can prevent yourself from having an outburst in the future, you know? And for me, with my triggers, it's just, if I know if I'm triggered, I'm just like, 
I'm triggered. I'm just going to walk away right now, you know, because when I trigger, I get yeah. very, very angry. <laughs> it's not right. this person that, you know, <laughs> that you see right here. You'd be like, who is this demon and send her back, please. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like a visceral, like a, you know, yeah. um, but, but I, I mean, yeah. Now, do you think that everyone is capable of persevering? I think that, I mean, unless, unless you have a distinct mental disorder that would prevent you from being in that capacity, then yes, I believe that everybody can have the choice of perseverance. perseverance. Because it is a choice. It is a choice. Perseverance is a choice. That's right. You know, but that is. There are, but there are certain people that do not have that ability. Right. But the, in the broader terms of most people can. And when, you know, I, I kind of like want to go back to something that I said earlier about, you know, we're responsible for our, for ours and no one can trigger us. You mm -hmm. know, no, you know, nobody can make us feel anyway. I need to make a distinction there as well. You know, if someone is stepping on your toe over and mm -hmm. over, <laughs> right. you know, now that they are making you feel a certain way if they are That's doing right. something over and over knowing that it's hurting you or upsetting you yes they are making you feel that way but right. if someone says something that upsets you you know all the time how often do you hear couples in particular you made me feel this way when you said that you made me do this you know and that's the point where you have to say no 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 I'm responsible for how I feel. You can't make me feel anyway because I'm in control of my emotions. And that's part of the benefit of healing from trauma, sitting with your anger and well, yeah. and and yeah. moving forward, right? It is. Um and you you bring up you bring up several points in that statement. So Yes. I <laughs> um, so one thing I want to say is that, I mean, okay, yes, we, we are responsible for our feelings. I mean, I mean, who we are, we feel it. But now if somebody makes you, does something, and you feel a certain way from that action, it's okay that you're, you're able to say, hey, you did this, and this is what you created in me. Yes. This is what yes. you do. What happens, though, is a lot of people, especially when you deal with, like, relationships to deal with like narcissism and all that you get a narcissistic sociopath they don't care how they made you feel right what they care right. about is they care about making sure that they stay in an upper hand with you to make you stay in the lesser version of yourself okay but you still feel what you're feeling so in order but you have to be able to convey those feelings and yes. sometimes you're feeling a certain way because of somebody else and it really is that feeling was created by somebody else's action. So while you are still in control of your own feelings, somebody else still created that feeling in you. Yes. And so yes. you have to be able to convey that to get rid of it. You got to be able to That's convey right. it to sort it so that you can let it go. That's right. That's right. Oh, such a good point. Okay. Now let's shift gears a little bit. All right. Okay. Repetition compulsion. <laughs> this is I one know. of my favorite topics. Uh, it's, I know. It's, fascinating yeah. to me, you know, so for those who don't know, what is repetition compulsion? All right. Well, I'm going to ask your permission for something. You know, we didn't okay. discuss this. <laughs> okay. We didn't talk about this fully, but I did a, I did a joint research thing. Okay. With <laughs> Sal McLeod, right. Who, who's a PhD, but it was on this topic. And what I would like to do, it's not that long, but I would like to read. Yes. A, portions of this article. Would that be okay with you? Yes. Yes, please do. Sure. Okay. Okay. It's, it's not that long. I promise. Okay. No but worries. It addresses perfectly this, okay. this topic. That's, I was very excited that when you brought that up, I was like, wait a minute, we've got this paper. <laughs> so, here we <laughs> awesome. go. All right. But repetition compulsion, often called trauma reenactment, is thought of as the unconscious need to recreate early traumas. A person may repeatedly physically or emotionally like painful situations that happened in the past. We got to create them now. It's, we're going to bring this into new situations. Okay. 
Trauma is a universal experience, and it can be defined as the gap between an external threat and one's inner resources to deal with it. At any time that a person is overwhelmed by fear or hopelessness, they have experienced such an event. Humans tend to seek comfort in what is familiar to them, and Sigmund Freud called this repetition compulsion, which is defined as the desire to return to an earlier state of things. And I'm going to pause there. Mm -hmm. Why that? Because we didn't get a resolve. Right. So right. We got to go back and relive it again because we're going right. to get it this time. And then we right. still don't get a resolve. And then we're going right. to go back and we're going to relive it again. Right. Yeah. Right. We're going to, yeah. we're going to master this now. We're going to get it this time. That's this right. person is going to be different. This person, I'm going to have the upper hand. That's this right. person. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So Freud held the, held the view that a person's inability to discuss or remember past traumatic events might lead them to repeat these traumas compulsively. The cycle. Repetition compulsion can involve people continuously putting themselves in a situation that they know is not healthy, perhaps without even realizing that they're repeating their past traumas. Why? Because we've gotten used to the box system. We've gotten used to where everything goes on the shelf. We, it's all organized. It's all neat. It's all categorized. That's the point. And we keep doing that. And we just continue to make more of that situation. These actions are most apparent in the types of relationships people engage in, particularly those that are dysfunctional. Despite knowing that relationships are destructive, we may continue to demonstrate patterns of these types of relationships. We may be trying to fix what happened in the past by recreating the trauma with new relationships with some arguing that we have an innate desire to complete something which has already begun. Yes, that yes, that makes perfect sense. I that's yes, that hits it right on the, the <laughs> nail right on the head. It's like the perfect <laughs> description. Now, now, so everybody's still scratching your heads about what is repetition compulsion. Here's some examples, right? Perfect. So repetition compulsion can occur in many situations, often when there is a a trauma that keeps being repeated. Some examples of this are someone who has experienced abuse as a child who goes on to have adult relationships, which are also abusive. That's one. Someone who experienced violence in their childhood is more likely to become perpetrators of violence later on in their life. Someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, having recurring dreams of the traumatic experiences. Okay. Someone who had an emotional distant parent or caregiver goes on to have adult relationships with people who are also emotionally distant because we're seeking that connect. Yeah. Uh, when, when feeling anxious, an individual turns to their favorite maybe movie or TV show and watches it over and over again. Another uh, last one is after being the victim of a crime, someone may seek out horror movies or watch a lot of crime documentaries to re-experience the similar feelings that they have already experienced live in their life. You just told me something about myself that I hadn't realized. <laughs> 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 crime shows, murder shows all the time, every day. That's all I watch is <laughs> like these so murder Vons shows. A, okay. Yeah, you're a CSI, CSI girl. Yeah. All right. All right. So, Okay, so with that, why is change hard? Repetition compulsion is just that. It's a compulsion. So when we are repeating the past, we're not doing it on purpose. Rather, it's a learned response to what we already know. We've made it our norm. It's our comfort. People almost feel compelled to return to a person or situation which recreates their past trauma. So therefore... There are several explanations as to why people find change so hard. Hmm. And here's some of those things. Familiar, familiarity of chaos. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Individuals may find change hard because they are so familiar with the chaos storm that they see this as their normal in my day to day. As a child, humans absorb what is presented to them. So if a child is brought up in a chaotic household, 
experiencing a parent with narcissistic tendencies or frequently observing abuse, then they may have no reason to believe that this environment is not normal. It oh becomes implanted. We make this because that's what I'm seeing. That's what you're raising me around. That's what right. I'm uh, being poured into me all of the years of adolescent, like mental uh, progression of how we learn. You know, uh, guys and girls are different with different cycles, but yeah. you got to think about those formative years, man. It's said that way for a reason. It's right. a formative reason. So it right. makes a big difference in how you raise. So at that time in their lives, the child has no way of comparison to what they experience. Thus, when they're older, they may be suspicious of having a relationship with someone who is not a reflection of their chaotic upbringing. Oh my God. Yeah. Th let me just tell you, I have an amazing husband now. We've been, we've been together almost 10 years now and he is, uh, he's, he's amazing. And I realize with my repetition compulsion, because my life has always been so chaotic that when my husband and I were doing really well and getting along really well, everything was going great. That's when my repetition compulsion would come in mm -hmm. because being happy and peaceful <laughs> wasn't comfortable. Right. It was new to me. It was, okay, this doesn't feel right. I'm not supposed to feel happy. I'm supposed to, now I've got to go back and do something that's going to make me feel horrible or you, right yeah that's what you're too. yeah, yeah. Um, totally relate to that totally <laughs> relate <Sorry>. to that <laughs> all right the next part is inflexible defenses all right people may have a rigid way of protecting themselves against the experience of repeating their trauma they believe that there is no point in trying to stop it and that that this is just the it's just the way things are Okay. So, however, this way of thinking can unintentionally result in the reenactment occurring anyway. So, if they were more consciously trying to stop the reenactment, then they may have more luck with actually stopping the cycle. Therefore, you got to get it up here. You got to be focused and see it happening. And when right. you see it that's, happening, that's the point. Yeah. And that's where therapy comes in. It helps you see it. it. Absolutely. You know? It helps yep. you see it, that what's going on, because you know what they say, you can't, you know, you see things clearer from the outside looking in, right? You're right. Yeah, you know, that, that's what they say. So it's like, it's hard to look at yourself. That's right. Absolutely. That's yeah. always, anytime there's change involved or you got to do something different, you're the biggest obstacle you will ever hit is you. Yes. <laughs> you, yes. you will always be the biggest obstacle. You know? Yep. Um. The next point here is creatures of habit, you know? So as humans, like we tend to see comfort and in, in what is familiar, you know, what's familiar, what's predictable. So sometimes we revert to familiarity because the outcome is predictable and because even healthy change, even if it is healthy change, it's still scary to us. So we want to go back to what we know is predictable. We know what to expect, you know, but if, 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 if we're trying to press ourselves, like, well, I know I need to get out of this abusive relationship, but what happens then? What happens mm -hmm. after? Well, it's okay what happens after because what happens after is you're going to be healthier and happier, and you're going to elevate past this abusive mentality and cycle that you've ingrained to put yourself into. You know? Right. Someone experiencing repetition compulsion might believe that new experiences will be more painful than their present situation. That is the part right there that's huge. Mm -hmm. New experiences are too new and untested, so it often feels safer to just stay where you are. That's it. I, that is so true. It's 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 just that's where you're. It goes back to the comfort level. You know, you're comfortable in the chaos. Yeah, Peace is uncomfortable. You know, so when you're happy, you're like, whoa, 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 something must be wrong here. It's like always yeah. waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Then we have emotional dysregulation. <laughs> Someone may find change difficult if they have poorly regulated emotional reactions in response to negative you know, stimuli. A parent or caregiver may have shut down a child when they got upset and did not comfort them. When the child grows up, well, they may have internalized that they deserve to be 
mistreated and that there is no reason for them to be upset. Therefore, now I'm going to shut down. Now I'm going to hush. And now I'm not going to tell you my feelings. Now I'm not going to share what I'm experiencing because I'm going to get a negative response from that if I do that because that's what I've made my normal. Right. Someone who has poorly regulated emotion, emotional reactions may also be very sensitive to criticism and interpret this as harsh and respond in a very hostile way. And something I want to add to that, but without tackling emotional dysregulation, people can be stuck in repetitive emotional cycles. In addition to that, now we go into self-sabotage. Now we uh. go into self-degrading. Now we go into all of those factors that tie into all of this right here because that's what we've made our normal. That's what we've that's right. decided. This is just the way it is. And this is just the way that, you know, we're going to be dealing with our stuff. You know? Right. Yeah. And yeah. You know, you're happy. You're not used to being happy. And it's like, oh, let's go self-sabotage this. Let's go. <laughs> let's go do something that's going to mess this up. But it, yes, it's, exactly. It's part of the cycle, you know. Exactly. Exactly. It's, and, you know, but, you answered all of my questions that I had about <laughs> that. That was like okay. so brilliant. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I was so happy to have uh, that I found this article because it was it, yeah it was, it was spot on. So oh my god, good, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, it really is. And you know, this might seem like a dumb question, but how do we know if we have repetition compulsion? How do we know if we have it? How can you identify it within yourself? A lot of times, I'll be honest. A lot of times, um, this for some people they can they already know it. I mean, a lot of people already know if you're OCD, you know, if you need to do certain things, you know, if you need to do, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. if you're repeating something, but a lot of times too, it, it's coming from other people around you. Now with that said, we don't need to live our life listening to everybody else pouring into our head. Excuse me. That's not where you need to be. But at the same token, sometimes that close best friend, family member, whatever they're sitting here saying, Hey, you're with like, you're with like the sixth guy. And, a year and guess what they are all abusive they are right, all, all the, the same, same. Mm. they're all the same and they're abusing you you need to stop all right that is the point where most people shut down that's the point where most people are like yep yeah, but you don't understand you mm. you just don't avon you don't understand she right. she's a good person you don't understand. right so, right right yeah. no no she's damaged and abusing me and but I don't want to see it because I've been abused for so long in the past. That, yeah, right. It's my normal. It's my cycle. Right. So it takes though being able, and a lot of times, I mean, <laughs> I, I have sat in on, I've legit sat in on interventions with where family came together to intervene for somebody that could not break the cycle. Wow. Like, but now most, again, that's, you know, that's not all the time. But I can tell you in the course of 27 years, I've probably sat in a, at least about 100 to 150 interventions to deal with this topic right here. Wow. It's a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult it thing do, to do to, is to break those cycles. But it's just it realizing that you deserve so much more. You deserve better. Oh, and that's, that's part listen. of the going back to the self-esteem, the, you know, absolutely self-value, sure. all of these things that it's all connected, all combined, and uh, it's all interwoven into <laughs> this listen, huge topic. I tell, I tell people this all the time and I you know, say, say it every day from now on, but the, there is no relationship on this planet more important than a relationship you have with yourself. Yes. That comes number one. I don't, I don't care about who you're dating. I don't care who you're married to. I don't mm -hmm. care who you're the parent of. I, it, none of that matters unless you have the relationship with yourself and understand you, because if you don't understand you, guess what? You don't know what it is you're putting in to be the best wife or husband that you can be the best boyfriend or girlfriend, the best friend, the best mm -hmm. anything. You got to mm -hmm. know who you are. You got to you got to come from a position of I know my value and I will claim my value, and I'm not going to be demeaned and degraded anymore. And also with trauma recovery, I am going to choose that I am not going to let this event dim my flame 
any mm. further. I'm going to rise above. I'm going to come out of this. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be more knowledgeable. I'm going to be better. And I'm never going to let myself be there again because we are all human beings. We are. We all make mistakes. We all have bad choices. We all sometimes suffer the consequence of other people's bad choices. But I'm going to love myself first and foremost. That doesn't make you selfish. That means there is a healthy selfish aspect there. And it's good. Mm -hmm. Have yeah. that. Own your own world, own your own self, own where you are and what you need as an individual because we are all unique, creative individuals. And nobody else is going to think like you. If you, so think that, if you think that everybody has the same heart as you, wake up because <laughs> that's what's going to mess you up. Oh, uh, so true. Yeah, I mean, you know that I just – I strongly relate to this uh, this topic, you know, the repetition compulsions. Do you mm -hmm. think that this is something that we can – we can kind of overcome on our own without therapy? Sometimes. I mean, but it really does depend on the situation. I mean. Level of trauma. Like, yeah. And, but listen, there's, there are, there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a reason therapy exists. Yeah. There's a reason why though, of the uh, simple aspect of you can't harbor everything that's happened to you. And think that you're going to be perfectly okay. You won't be. There's a reason why harboring is harmful. You yeah. got to have a release. You got to let stuff out. You know, I, I, I'll, I'm not sharing any details here, but I, I sat down with a person today just for lunch, just to sit and have lunch. And you know what? One statement was made and they released. Mm. Buddy, they released probably. Five years of stuff that they've been holding on to. It just came out just today during lunch. It was just just a buddy of mine, and wow. and when it was done, he was like, "I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry." I was oh like, no, oh. that's amazing. I, I, I got it. Gave him a big old hug, and I was like, oh, yeah. "You're good, man." <laughs> and I bet I said, "I bet you feel better, don't you?" He's like, "I do." But he feels <laughs> so, a lot lighter. Like, but he feels a do. lot lighter. <laughs> I feel lighter, baby. I'm good. Yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I was like, don't ever hold stuff in. No. And, but trauma is different. Tra yeah. When you go through trauma and abuse, that's not something you need to hold in and be like, well, it's okay. I'm an adult. I can deal with this. I don't need to bring anybody else into it. No, that's, that's just not good thinking. You need to bring other people into it because that's your support system. And those are the people that can help you. Right. And, you know, and, and getting therapy doesn't make you weak or, or sick or like something's oh wrong with you. I have my own therapist. That yes. Has, 30 years. Okay. So I'm just, I, I say everybody needs therapy in my opinion. Everybody yeah. should have a therapist. Uh, to a degree. I mean, yeah. To a, I mean, think about this. What I love about it so much is I have my person that I go to in my appointments and I get to vent sure. and say anything that I want to say. And I know that that person has my back no matter what, you know, that yep. they're, that they're in it to, uh, you know, for my, what's in my best interest, you yeah. know, and wow, I mean, this is something that I swear we could talk for hours and yeah. hours and hours. Um, oh, yeah. You know, it's the topic Listen, this, is so fascinating. This, uh, well, this article uh, um, research thing that I was sharing from, okay, it goes on for like another like two pages. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sure saying, it does. So yes, we could we could easily make a whole another part two to this show. I can tell you. I, I, you know, we we might do that because I do have a few more questions that uh, okay. you know, that I would want to get into, but maybe at, at yeah. a later show. You know, okay. um, you know, because I, you know, I do want to know, you know, what is your advice for? or two survivors of child sexual abuse on how to start the healing process. In with, with that, with that level of, of, with that level of trauma. Okay. That is something. And, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a psychologist. I'm telling you because it's a, <laughs> it's a scientific thing, but you, that is an area you need to find a therapist. Yes, you need to find you somebody. That. You need to find somebody that you feel comfortable with. Yes. You need to find somebody that's going to actually really, I mean, listen, and I'm just going to throw this on a side note. When you get therapy, you better, it's okay if you talk to three or four therapists before you decide on one. Don't just assume somebody that somebody's saying they're a psychologist, they're going to be the right, excuse me, fit for you. 
That's and right. That's right. When you and when you deal with um, when you deal with uh, sexual child abuse and things of that nature, well, that takes a very specific type of therapy. Yes. Number one, because I mean, it is dealing with like, listen, our sexuality. Well, that's part of us being human. That's yeah. part of our, you know, that's part of our passion and how we explore intimacy and all of those things. And so when that gets damaged, sadly, early on in life, we don't want that bad cycle setting in to where now all of a sudden we've we we have lost the ability to be able to have that in our life because right. anytime that there's intimacy we were immediately triggered well that's why it's important you've got to have a, a structure and what's going to give you the healthy structure is therapy right absolutely um, thank you for saying that because that's um uh, i i i know so many people um sadly, who have been abused that they're like, oh, I'm just, I can deal with it on my own. And I'm like, no, you can't. No, <laughs> no. no you can't. And that's not a slight to anybody, but it's right. that trauma is so devastating. Yeah, it is. And, it's and like so, soul murder. And a lot of people know? think too, a lot of people think too, oh, well, you know, that happened back when I was like eight. Okay. Oh. Well, well, guess what? Oh, guess what's going to happen when you have kids and yet that kid is eight years old. That's going to come right. back and smack you that's in the right. face. That's what's going to happen. Right. But people dismiss it, though. They try to dismiss it. Yeah. And so, and that's not something you just dismiss. You know? No. And you know, the thing is, I think that there's a, there's a, a huge misconception about children and resiliency <laughs> and that <laughs> children are so resilient that they can overcome anything, including. Well, they'll be fine. Exactly. Yeah. They won't even remember oh, this. They'll exactly. Right. They won't even remember this, you know, when they're older. Yeah. Uh, and I am trying to shatter that misconception because. Let me tell you, oh, go, no, go ahead. Sorry. You no, know, because when it comes to children and child sexual abuse, yeah. that is not something that they can handle on their own. That yeah. is not something that they can overcome on their own. No. You have and, to get them therapy. And one thing I want to. Um, uh, I want to add into all of this is that I want you guys, and, and this is something I talk about a lot. And that is that you have to remember that your subconscious, that is your data vault for mm -hmm. every word said to you, every action done to you, every yeah. experience that you've had in your life from the time that you are born, your subconscious clicks in. Yep. And so when you're five, Six, seven, eight. Your subconscious is remembering all the stuff that happens. And so later, when your conscious mind gets triggered by something, your subconscious kicking in data that connects to that trigger. That's exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. So if you picture it like two two things going on here, yep. but your subconscious, that's why you need that's why it's important that you have to maintain a uh, a valuable, healthy concept of the relationship with yourself because it means that you allow your conscious mind to be told to shut the hell up sometimes yeah so that, you, yeah. So that your subconscious can communicate to your heart so you can actually gain a healthy approach to what's happening oh, that you know what that's a beautiful place for us to to end on right there you know my fi well actually i have one more question my final question for you is do you have any projects or anything you'd like to promote right now and tell us <laughs> when and where everybody can can tune into psych candy well i have been i have been on, on a small little hiatus for a little bit um psych candy will be returning next week so um actually a week from today will okay. uh, be the the return of psych candy uh and for right now it will still be monday uh monday through friday at eleven thirty a.m but i am transitioning for the new year psych candy is going to become a morning show Okay. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to have a co-host and everything. So it's going to be fun oh, stuff. Oh, fun. That's fun. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then the uh, the other thing is that I am excited about this, so I will share it. Uh, it was going to be at the end of this year, but they had to move it back a little bit, which was good, actually, for me, too. So, But if you guys are familiar with NPR, mm -hmm. well, there's a show in there called All Things Considered. Oh, that, little, gonna, little, show? that, that little, little show? That little show? That little show? <laughs> I'm going to be on there uh, in March of 2023, and we're doing it because they want to talk to me about atmospheric therapy. Oh, wow. So we're going to be on there talking about that, and I've got um, – I have five uh, former patients – well, 
one still a patient, but I have five patients that are coming on to attest to how that type of therapy like helps them, like, save, oh, wow. save them from, yeah, because they had just, they had been textbook to death and nothing was happening. And like yeah. three of the five were like suicidal and they almost took their life and stuff. Oh and my so God. That, that blesses my heart that not because I'm toot my own horn, but because I love the fact that yes, we, you don't have to be textbooked. Yes. There are other means of therapy. Yes. Alternative mm-hmm. therapy is a real thing and it's okay. It doesn't mean it's like some right. dollar general for a, you know, yeah, therapy yeah. approach. It right. means that yeah. maybe, maybe you need something different and that's okay. Yeah. yeah different is okay. You different know, so, is okay. so everybody please go and follow Trinity. Um, definitely, you know, check out his podcast and, and I, I'm going to be looking forward to the NPR. I'm going to, you know, make a calendar calendar note about it so I can <laughs> so I can check it out. I'll, but I'll send you notes, and, and you know that I'm going to have you now as a guest on my show. Yes, please. I would love to. Okay. I would love right. to. You know, I've right. really enjoyed having you on tonight. This conversation. Thank you and, so much, Yvonne. Thank and you. I hope that we can coll- collaborate again in the future. But um, yeah, yeah. But before I go. I want to remind you that none of us are perfect, everybody. None of us are perfect. And every one of us struggles in our own unique way. It's not a competition about who's had it worse or who feels the worst or who needs to heal the most. It's about all of us recognizing that our pain matters. We matter. It's about making ourselves a priority for once and being compassionate with ourselves regardless of where we are in our journey. You know, again, perseverance is persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success, like taking that test again and again until you pass. Perseveration is the continuation or recurrence of an experience or activity without the appropriate stimulus, like returning to people or places that cause emotional harm. Now that we all know the difference between the two, I really hope it will help you move away from perseveration and into perseverance. And with that, I want to thank all of you for joining me tonight for episode 19 of Survivor Strong. For those of you in the Miami area, I will be at the Miami Book Fair on Friday, November 18th and Sunday, November 20th from 9 to 5. Come find me in Section D. Say hi and bring your copy of my memoir, The Invisible Girl. Get that on here somewhere. <laughs> and don't worry if you don't have a copy yet. Uh, you know, I'll have books on hand um, that you can purchase via Cash, Venmo, Cash App, PayPal. And of course, I'll sign your copies too. And I look forward to seeing you all there. We will be off for the next couple of weeks for the Thanksgiving holidays, but I will be back on Wednesday, November 30th at 7 p.m. right here, live on Fireside, Facebook, and YouTube. Remember, you got this. We are all in this together. Until next time, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody.